be sweating by the end. <laughs> it's going to be so hot in there. <laughs> Valerian. Ed? Yeah. I'll say goodbye to you then. Yeah. Bye, cheers. Cheers, bye. Bye. How's your audio going, Mark? It's going. It's been going, yeah. On video. <clears throat> Welcome to the Dear Love Joy podcast, and it's a special. Our guest today is uh, a doctor and an ex pro triathlete, Dr. Tamsin Lewis. Hello, Tamsin. Hello. What should I call you, Dr. Tamsin or Tamsin? Uh, call, call me Tam. Dr. Tam is what a lot of people call it. Just Tam is good. Okay, Dr. Tamsin is a medical doctor trained at King's College London. Her medical career began in psychiatry from an early age. Um, she was interested in the mind-body connection and the interplay between physical and mental health. Tamsin became a pro a a triathlete by a mistake. And then she went on, on to win her first Ironman, Ironman, two th uh, sorry, Ironman UK 2015, which sounds a bit sexist to me. Tamsin's passion is personalised healthcare, health data tracking, and patient empowerment to live well. Her specialist interest in, um, is in health span, which is living well longer, in the context of a uh, systems medicine approach, particularly gut health, hormonal balance, and psychological resilience. Have I got that correct, Tamsin? There's a lot of big words in there. <laughs> Makes sense, though, sort of. Essentially, all I'm... I'm I'm, I'm all about just trying to get people to engage with their health, to feel and function better, and just to, to, to live, their, live their life more empowered. Okay, before we get stuck into this, with all my podcast guests, I always buy them a present, and I've got you one. But this is... Un present. Yeah, but uh, this is unbelievable. Now, I know you like balsamic vinegar. <laughs> We've so had a few lunches together, so, and I'm dousing. So, so I went to a shop, and I bought you balsamic vinegar, but I've left the price on, which is really uncouth because I could not believe how much this costs. There's that tiny little bottle there. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see 19 pounds 50. Is it a grand reserva? I'm I've so excited. Do you know what I don't know because I don't know anything about balsamic vinegar, do you? I know a lot about balsamic vinegar and I know that um, I, I cover my food in it, one, because it increases the uh, how well the fats and proteins are digested and it tends to improve, so improve the digestive environment. So. Does it? Yes, it Good. does. Because you eat it a bit like soup, I noticed the other day. <laughs> yeah, I think I overdid it that one day. I kind of chucked on a whole load to my salad. Yeah, you could, um, have, you could have had a spoon to finish it off. But really, £19.50, is it worth it? I mean, uh, can a balsamic vinegar be worth nearly 20 quid? That's, it's a tiny bottle, and it's like the price of a bottle of wine. That's true. Well, there you go. It's probably got full of polyphenols and all sorts of goodies. So one not that not only does it improve the digestive environment so you get more out of your food but you've also got some polyphenols in there which apparently help you live longer what do they do they're also present in red wine and uh green tea dark chocolate uh tim specter was on this podcast not so long ago he was yes. telling us all about that yeah it was, he was he gave us good news we were allowed to drink coffee uh drink red wine and eat dark chocolate and he also quite liked chili as well so he thought yeah. he thought spices were good so spices are good yeah all, all, all encourages the growth of good bacteria which uh, do you know tim you're all friends in in your industry uh we are i met tim a couple of years ago he was um speaking at wired health conference all about the microbiome and um there are a few companies there that were trying to sort of productize the microbiome so how to capture that data and, and so get you to test your poop basically right. to, to see what's in there um, and Tim was talking about how how actually a lot of those tests weren't accurate. Um, yeah. And then he set up his own company, do you know, British Gut. And then um, um, so he's getting people to engage with their gut health. But you know, it's okay. an expanding film. We don't know that much. Yeah, that's that's the thing. We don't know a lot about our bodies. I've, I've realised after doing this podcast for a while, it seems to be we seems to be at a really good place in medicine at the moment, where we're in a boom industry because we're learning. We'll talk more about this in a minute. But I want to get onto your Iron, um, your sexist Iron Man. Uh, <laughs> before we do that, but, but um, yeah, so we'll, we'll leave that. We'll park it and come leave back to that. Leave go. I'll have that later. Yeah, right. Cool. So, so before we talk about your knowledge of mental health and health, um, you accidentally became a triathlete. I'd, I'd say accidentally. Look, um, I was a sporty child. Um, was quite good at sport uh, for some reason. I think my dad. I've got the the sports gene, as it were. My dad was a Tour de France cyclist, so he grew up. Uh, cycling for Wales, did two times Tour de France, famously gave Tom Simpson, um, who was a very famous British cyclist, his yeah, he's the one who, before he died. Yeah, yeah, he's the one who died, wasn't he, on the on the mountains? He, he died was... on Mont Ventoux and famously sort of said, put me back on my bike. Um, 
and as he was dying and then they did and then he rode 10 meters up the road and then fell off again and I was I grew up hearing those stories of and it was so romantic so passionate so um so crazy but really and and I yeah as, as I said I grew what up did he with, die of heart attack he d- yeah because he, he was dehydrated full of amphetamines probably some mild steroids that they took in those days so in those days they didn't have a method to track the drugs that they were taking so you know we knew on a high level that amphetamines increase your heart rate they increase your performance because they reduce perception of effort so you could keep going for longer but on that day it was really hot he was dehydrated and both the combination of the the speed the amphetamines the um the dehydration the heat just put him off so was he taking illegal drugs back then was that or or did they i think back then they just didn't have the test to test for it but you know a lot of people um, and my dad because he was a domestique um, to always told me that he didn't have access to these drugs because they're expensive. I don't know whether I believe them or not. But <laughs> All right, so let, c- carry on with so your tri- tri- triathlon So going on for that, so I, I had the sport gene. I grew up around that, but I actually um, did, did some sport at school, but then went to med school and discovered drinking and a little bit of smoking and studied and, yeah, a little went off the rails a bit and so didn't do much sport but then I had a boyfriend at the time who did triathlon I used to go and watch him and it was like wow how do people actually keep going that long because I came from a background where I'd had eating disorders and issues around food and I couldn't kind of get my head around how you can eat enough to keep going for like two three hours and it was sort of a mind shift anyway um one day when we split up I decided right I'm just going to do a triathlon so I did one and didn't do much training kind of it was a Blenheim triathlon in Oxfordshire which is a really famous one for for newbies yeah and you dive in the the lake and you go hell for leather and then bike and run and I did quite well I think I won my age group which was just bizarre to me and that empowered me because I'd had that period at university where I was I wasn't very well like mentally because I was just running on fumes I was um you know, studying hard, drinking, was probably Try depressed. not to bang the table. Try <laughs> not to bang the table. That's the first thing you told me, don't bang the table. It just goes <laughs> straight through the mics. But anyway, go on, carry on. Too passionate. Anyway, yeah. um, actually, d- d- and I always maintain triathlon saved me because what it did is provide a focus and also, so it stopped me drinking too much. It made me focus on my nutrition and my health and my sleep a bit more. And also it took this sort of transferred my addictive tendencies into sport because one I was good at it you get the endorphins the brain boost when you actually compete and you do well so I um so I did well at triathlon and then I discovered that I wanted to train for it and I trained got fairly good got picked by won my amateur world championship from 2009 and then got recognized by a world-class coach he said take some time off work and I got a bit of sponsorship took a year off work went to Thailand trained with Brett Sutton, who's this famous crazy coach who trained Chrissy Wellington, one of the best triathletes of all time. And um, yeah, the rest is history. And that culminated in me winning my first attempt at the Ironman distance. Ironman, I say Ironman because it's a brand. Um, Yeah, didn't they have to rebrand that, surely? Because it just sounds really sexist. No, they can't rebrand it. It's worth billions, that brand now. It got bought by a Chinese company recently for like God knows how much. Um, doesn't make sense though does it in our new it doesn't world make, it, it doesn't make sense but I think maybe they're gonna have to sub-brand it right Iron Woman Iron, they've got Iron Kids so surely they can do Iron Woman but yeah. um, but that it was it's a very compelling brand because people you know people actually tattoo themselves with the M dot right okay which just shows you how and it, I think that reflects a general consensus in society that we just want to we want to feel one we want to be part of something a tribe Two, we want to test ourselves because I think life's just got a bit too, you know, a bit too easy. We kind of drive into work. We have a, you know what I mean. And then pe- people are more looking for the next thing to challenge themselves. And Ironman serves a tick slot. So, so was it the first Ironman you entered? 2015? Ironman it it was. I mean, my coach had asked me to do Ironman for, for probably about two years before because he said that my body was, was set up for it. But my mind was holding me back because I, I just kept thinking about how long it is. I mean, it's, okay, tell us know, the distances again. It's, uh, I'm going to get this wrong now, 3.8 kilometer swim, which I think is 2.4 miles. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Um, 180 kilometer bike, which is 112 miles, and then a marathon. <laughs> and I just looked to throw at it and gone, how do you actually do that? What, <laughs> well, you did it. What, are the, what sort of times you look at? What times roughly did you do on that then? So the swim, how long was that? 
so the swim I did in like I think about 54 55 minutes yeah it was in a lake in Bolton I'm like if I'm ever gonna do an Ironman I want to do a glamorous one in Mallorca or Nice don't they do it in Hawaii every year yeah Hawaii is the world championships and that's yeah. the ultimate in glamour and yeah. I've been there and worked as a medical doctor um a few times in the tent there so I'll come back to that but um Ironman UK the sponsors loved it and the, the, the crowds were incredible being northern England they were lining the streets like five deep cheering for me and you know the emotion attached to that day for me is just so strong um so it was a so 55 yeah. minute for the the 3.8k swim and then the bike was something like five and a half hours which was good it was a i mean it's very bumpy um suited me perfectly twisty turny up and down and then the run i think i did in about 3:16, three hours 16 the marathon which it wasn't flat it was up and down as well but having not hadn't actually run a marathon at all before that day ever ever so i came off the bike going what now you're like david goggins my hero <laughs> if anyone hasn't listened to or read about david please goggins please, the guys you go on about him all the time the guy's yeah. a loony yeah he's 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 amazing yeah so um so go on so so it was just a natural thing for you you just how, how far into the race did you realize you were going to win it so i wasn't winning it until sort of midway through the bike I just thought, right, I'm just going to keep comfortable. I'm going to externalize because I think we uh, often we get caught in our thought processes of, oh, my foot's aching, my thigh's aching, or, you know, or the stomach's aching. And I said, right, you're on the bike, look around, take in the atmosphere, enjoy it. Try not to be, you know, just stay in the moment. Don't think ahead too much. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I was, I was leading and then the cameras were on me and then I was carried away with all this excitement of, Tamsin's leading the race, it's her first Ironman. And I thought, keep going, keep going, stay in the moment, don't push it too much. So then I got off the bike and obviously loads of cameras, loads of people cheering and I was more excitable and I thought, ow, my legs hurt, I've got a marathon to run. But then I said, right, just get to the next start, just get to the next age station, the next one, the next one, and just focus on fueling. And then, you know, kind of I got to about 10 miles to go and my legs seriously hurt because I'd never, like I said, never run a marathon or even trained for one properly. And there was a hill, and I said, right, I've got to walk. And I, a couple of my friends were there, and they like, my legs started to go a bit, and they're like, don't walk. So I didn't, I just kept running. And then I had one of the most, you know how you remember times and moments and feelings, and I had a bike with me, so there's, they follow you on a bike. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what they call them, but the man on the bike that kind of leads you, the lead three women one, and men. And he kept saying to me, he just was, you know, constantly encouraging me and saying, you're doing so well, don't think ahead, focus on your breathing, take another gel. I'm like, I need free coaching here. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and how close were your rivals at this stage? Um, so I had a girl that was behind me and she was running really fast and she was, I, but she was still 15 minutes behind me. But and you're being told this, are you? I was being told kind of that, that, that she was closing the gap slightly, but I was ahead and because I'd never and run And what's that feeling like then, being chased down? Yeah, it's horrible. Because <laughs> I have in my head, I don't know if you ever watched it, the original Iron Man Hawaii no, I've never shows watched these where they, they, it's called The Crawl. You should probably put a link to it. Honestly, it's amazing because okay. I kind of grew up watching that. It's the Iron Man Crawl with uh, Sean Welsh and I um, can't remember the other girl's name, but they literally, the legs are wobbling and both of them get onto the finish line, the last 400 metres, and they, their legs give up. So they're both I've crawling. seen that, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah I yeah. mean... And I thought that was going to be me. I'm, I'm just have to pause. Can you open, Jen? Do you mind just opening that window? Because it is so. Are you hot? It's yeah. I'm so hot in here. We're gonna have to risk the noise. We need a bit of a Dyson fan or something. Oh, my goodness, I'm gonna have to get one of those. Um... Tim's got a sweater. Oh, seriously? <laughs> it's me talking about Hawaii and crawling down finish line shoots. I, I feel like I'm in a sauna. It's ridiculous. It so, is. Um, it is too, a solarium in here. Too hot. So, um, yeah. So, what what is it that when you're doing um, uh, an Ironman, what's harder, mentally or physically? What's the hard bit? I think the, the mental is definitely, you have to train your mind. Because it's, it's sort of like you're on the limit of discomfort for a long time. It's not like going out and running for 5K where you're like breathing hard and you're pushing and pushing and pushing. It's like just sustained discomfort. Yeah. Until really like the last 10K when you just have to grit and what have you inherited off your dad that you talk about your genes you inherited is that a mental thing or a, or a physical or both what do you think I, I think it's always got to be a combination of both i'm very um competitive i'm very kind of mentally resilient i never like to give up tenacious 
but also I've got I've got the endurance gene, whatever that means. You know, I think I've got, and, and and you inherit that from mum and dad. So from mum, you inherit your mitochondria, which is the energy powerhouse of your cell. The mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother. So my mum is a, is a you know doer. She's not wasn't an athlete, but she's very much a do or die. Um, so the energy efficiency um, comes from your mum, and then yeah, I mean the athleticism part must come from my dad and my even my granddad who was a swimmer with endurance um events is it when you're born that uh, that basically dictates whether you're going to be one of them or not mm. you can't train yourself to be endurance if you haven't got the right genes is that true or not no that i don't think that's true it depends on the endurance event i think i mean iron man's just an extreme example i think I, you can definitely train um an engine so your aerobic engine, which is basically how well you, you your body keeps going at a, a certain heart rate, you can definitely train that. But um, you know, one of Brett Sutton, the coach that I mentioned, um, used to say, um, what he used to say a, a number of things, but uh, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard. Good, I like that one. That's cool. And he used what? to all the time put this girl in front of me. He was it was a girl called Bella Bayless who had he said, look at her. She, and, and he would say that she's not a natural athlete. She's got no. She's got a tenth of your physiology because he used to say, "Well, you've got the best pecs on the team and all stuff like that." I was like, "God." Anyway, so she didn't look like an athlete, but she beat the shit out of most people yeah. because she just nailed it day in day out. She wasn't the b- smartest cookie in the box, but she just resilient, resilient, push, 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 push. And you know that consistency doesn't have to be hard, but it does have to be consistent, which in turn makes it hard so let's talk about the training then because yeah. um i always joke on sunday brunch with people the person you don't want to ever employ is a triathlete mm. and only because i've worked with a few and they just have so many excuses to try and get out of work yeah. because the training schedule is so hard mm. you you've got to try and be doing something every day i imagine what it when you're training for you for an ironman or a triathlon what what is the schedule like during the week i, I guess it depends on your goals and how much where you've come from so you know what type of person you are are you training from scratch but you know most people i think most people overtrain. you know like they're, they're they're out there doing their 15 to 20 hour weeks just because they think they should and they're not doing it as structured so they're just doing you know some vague you know low heart rate training which actually isn't serving them for much purpose so i always say to people look either get a coach or go into each session with a purpose you know so that you so that you're prob- maybe even halving the, the session length so the time you spend training, but it's more focused. So you're actually, you know, your goal heart rate or your, you know, you're working on your functional um, functional efficiency. So the way that, for example, running, like people run terribly, so they're not very efficient at running. Yeah. So it takes more out of them. So I say, look, look have your technique, analyze your swimming as well. And then on the bike, you're better off doing race pace efforts rather than just going out for five hours. But you can never win a triathlon uh, on the swim anyway, can you? Apparently not. <laughs> That's what the Brownlee brothers told me. Depends on you. I mean, at the pointy end, you can... It's, it's on the cycle and the run, isn't it? You can put yourself into a very good position to run the race, if in the, in to, to win the race right. in, on the swim. Spe- uh, you know, if you're at the back of the pack in, in the swim, you're never going to win the race, put it right. that way, because you'll take too much out okay. of yourself. So it's strategic swimming. Okay. So now we've got a problem with the aeroplanes now. Now <laughs> we've got the, the windows open. We'll have to close them in a minute, but it was so hot. Was everyone else hot? Oh, man. All right, so... Um, you not got a fan? No, you just I do stand not, there and... I'm going to get a fan. I've got to get one now, so apologies for the aeroplane going over. Um, you, you did tell me you do overheat and over sweat. We could talk about that. Maybe some of your tests will reveal why. Yeah, we're going to test me later, aren't we? Which is yeah. exciting. So I'm going to get a blood test live and some other tests. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so how did you manage to do training and be a doctor at the same time? Um, with difficulty, because you know that competitive instinct takes over, and you go, right, I could be, I could be doing more. And then yeah. you're so tired, you can't focus properly on the work. So actually, um, yeah, I struggled. I just didn't have a social life. Basically, I just worked and, and trained, but. When I was an amateur athlete, it was probably only training you know, once a day. And then when I became a professional, and I took, I worked part time. So one, I took it, I took a year out, which is when I first got the opportunity to to race pro and train with some of the best athletes in the world. And I felt totally inadequate. And I uh, arrived in Thailand amongst some of these amazing triathletes, and I was like, oh, 
Um, How long does it take before you fit in a thing and I'm the same as them? I think you just have to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> I think you either have to like <laughs> get up with them on the track and stay there and then they look at you as if to say, who are you? You're a yeah. newbie. And then they push you harder. And I learned, you know, in retrospect, I le- learned a lot from that time. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. Um, I did. I learned a lot from, from what I, I tell you what I did learn is a lot about resilience, grit, just getting on with it, not moaning, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just eat, sleep, train, eat, sleep, train. So th- to answer your question, it's very difficult to get the balance right. And I now, and I guess the professional I do now is because I help a lot of people that are trying to be a better version of themselves and manage life, family, training, challenges, health, um, and all that con- conglomerate. So I think you have to, t- you have to be realistic. So when I, you have to be realistic with the goal that you want to achieve and it can't be performance and all costs and for a lot of people it is you know their relationships die off yeah can you be a triathlete and be a good partner to someone can you do there's it? always either you're both doing it and you have part-time jobs because a lot of the people that do well in this sport especially at the ironman distance are either working part-time or working for themselves or their teachers who have like huge summers and then bulk train um so yeah i don't think i think that one partner has to be very patient and very um, accepting, and that that definitely wasn't my situation. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So, um, is it good for you to do endurance sport um, health-wise? I mean, obviously, that's a very vague question, but I think uh, you got to to answer it well. You have to say one you have to look at the reason why you're doing the endurance sport what what you're doing it for what purpose does it serve for you are you enjoying it or are you just doing it as uh, because you have to because it's part of your almost like your addictive transference so you have to get up and and train otherwise you one don't feel good in yourself so your self-confidence is so linked to your ability to train so that's one thing and two, is it is it being stressful? Are you literally coming out of each session feeling tired? You should be invigorated by exercise, not exhausted by it consistently. Um, and there's a bit there's a bit of to and froing in that because this concept called hormesis, which is a little bit of um, a little bit of stress, you adapt and you get stronger. But for a lot of people, they keep stressing themselves and not recover in adequately, so they don't they don't sleep right, they don't eat right. They're constantly on edge about how they could be doing something to improve their performance and that's stressful so that could be for example you know they get they go out and they won't have anything to to, you know any booze they won't have um you know they have to look at micro nutrients in their food yeah all of that kind of orthorexic tendency as we call it now which is food obsession essentially which is you know a a bigger bigger topic um is stressful so the people that have longevity in the sport and and health associated with the sport are the people that can really relax put it in context they have a good support network they don't beat themselves up consistently when everything goes wrong you know those are the people that do well but the endurance sport per se we now know especially running is is stressful and that stress can cause um it's manifested in what they call oxidative damage in the body and you know for a lot of people that can manifest as um repeated injury you know, cognitive decline um and yeah other, other what, problems. what about physically though is it is endurance sport good for you physically I there, there must, is there a is there a stage where it goes from being be good for spot, you and then yeah. i mean if you're doing too much does it does it start having detrimental effects on your on your body well that's uh, that's what we know and obviously there's there's so many variances and that's the way medicine's going and in, in to be able to capture personalized information about people because what works for you is not the same as what works for me or um, the, the, the people here. You know, mm. everyone is slightly different because, and we don't know, everyone has slightly different genes, genetic expression, that type of thing. But there's a really good talk by um, a cardiologist whose name I temporarily forget, which is um, don't run too far, running too far or too fast um, will accelerate your. Um, it accelerate how quickly you reach a graveyard, something like that. We should find it. It's a good TED talk. Do you, do you, when I did, I did a, a cycle once. I hate cycling, by the way, but I did it from Belgium to London. And I just really didn't enjoy myself at all. But I decided to train for it properly, and I got some guys to test my uh, V 
um, something Fear Max. Fear 2 Max. Yeah, yeah. Fear 2 Max. And then they said to the guy said, oh, I do this a lot with a lot of athletes. And he goes, do you know why athletes train so hard, pro athletes? I said, no. And he goes, because uh, they can, not because they need to. And he says, we're often finding that athletes are overtraining now. You can train too much, which is what you basically you're saying at the top of this, right? That people train too much. People train too much generally. And, you know, some people do, uh, the, the diesel engines actually can do quite well. And that's where a coach and looking at some data and tracking data, so that could be a blood test, whatever type of test, can give you insights into if it's working for you or is it stressful and how to change it up. Yeah. Because, you know, I think one of the things that, that work best for me is when I switch from this crazy Ironman coach, Brett Sutton, who had me doing big hours, to a lo- um, more local coach who was very scientific and he literally had me doing, you know, more strategic sessions, less volume, but more intensity, more strength work. And, you know, when I did Ironman UK and, um, and won that race, I was only training about 16 hours a week, which was nonsense for most, you know, endurance events. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's um, it's about uh, when we had the... Uh, um, on the, the all the Olympians come back and they were all won their medals and stuff. They were all telling us that the rest actually has become more of an issue than the exercise. The coach, they're putting uh, GPS monitors and stuff on them to make sure they're not moving and not going out of the house and that mm. they're resting because rest seems to be more important now for your body than the actual exercise or as important, including sleep. Yeah, and I think that, that commonly goes missed. People think you're actually getting fitter by doing the training when actually you get fitter, and this is important, by adapting to the training. So the training is causing a stimulus, a reaction within the body, and what happens with that reaction determines how whether you whether you benefit from the exercise. So rest is part, allows that adaptation to occur, but that rest needs to be recuperative, it needs to be supported by the right nutrition, and it needs to not be the athlete just lying there going, mm, you know, twitchy feet, twitchy feet. And obviously it's stressful having your whereabouts monitored as well. So there might be a bit of an impact there. Okay. I've got a good question for you now, but um, only because it was, you tweeted about this during the week. So I thought, <laughs> so I thought <laughs> that was like, if it's the one I think that was the most so I think retweeted I've, tweet for a while. I think I'll bring it up, which is uh, on your website, it says that um, you were uh, a day pregnant when you won your um, Ironman UK. On, yeah. y- on an interview I've listened to, you said you were 12 hours pregnant, which probably means that you were having sex before you won um, the uh, <laughs> the Ironman UK 2015. I didn't think athletes were allowed to have <laughs> sex the day before an event. Uh, yeah, so did there's, there's did a you few did tweet, things here. You did tweet about that, didn't you? I did tweet about <laughs> this, and one, because I read the article and thought this, it was a very scientific article, I thought, that's interesting. Let's let's make it speak to the uh, the, the, the more a larger audience. Anyway, people, a few people have commented on that 12 hours versus a day, and I think what they took away was that I was having so little sex in my, during my time as an athlete that I could pinpoint to the hour <laughs> <laughs> when I literally... Um, had, had sex. Well, I so wouldn't like, imagine most athletes <laughs> were thinking, I'm going to do an Ironman tomorrow. Hey, why don't I have some sex before, before the, the night before? Um, It'd be the last thing on most people's minds. They'd be, yes. They'd be carb loading or something. Yes, that's true. I, I think for me, there's so two things. Let's go back to the tweet. So there's a really, <laughs> really cool article. Um, <laughs> I follow this guy called Trent Stellingworth, who's incredible on Twitter. He's, a, he's an exercise uh, scientist, physiologist, PhD, 100 lessons off. Now. Anyway, he tweeted a research article, it was published on PubMed, which basically said, looked at whether sex before an event affects your performance. And the takeaway from it was that it didn't, unless it was really, um, really energetic, multi-orgasmic and in multiple positions, which could cause injury <laughs> risk. So I think for me, it was more like, you know, can I, it was, you know, it was my, with my partner at the time who I was kind of with and wasn't with. And it was, it was more like, can I just be relaxed? please and it you know it was all over in like 10 well, minutes but <laughs> it certainly didn't tick any of those boxes so as long as the sex is not good as long as it's crap sex you're all right as, to long, have it it's, prior, as long as it's lying down prior. you know snugly sex all right then, um, you're all right <laughs> so i think performance wise for me it probably boosted it in retrospect and obviously i've done a lot of thinking about this because i'm a scientist and a doctor and i was thinking yeah. that hormone surge because as athletes you you exist one i did not think i was fertile because the doctors at the time were like you're 11% body fat. How can you be fertile? Um, I know we've kind of gone off track slightly here, but um, I is didn't that what happens if you're yeah. if you're a uh, if you're doing a lot of endurance athletics as a as um, yes. as a, as a female? You 
you become infertile for a while. Um, yes, and again, drops. genes come into it too. There's the, you know, there's some certain people maintain periods despite being very low body fat. And what we now know is it's actually not related to body fat per se. It's related to energy sufficiency, which is basically, are you feeding and fueling and supporting yourself enough? So there's people that maintain menstrual cycles with very low body fat because they're calm, they're eating enough, they're resting enough. And some people, the caveat to that, could be 20% body fat and not have any periods because they're running high cortisol levels, stress hormone levels. So it's basically a brain perception of stress. When this, the brain perceives there's too much stress, and that can be life, relationships, physical, then it shuts down the connection to the ovaries, which means you don't ovulate. So that's a pretty good sign then, that you're not looking after yourself if you're a, if you're a woman and your, your periods stop, is it? It's a pretty good sign, yeah. And, there's, and they've redefined it. It used to be called the female athlete triad. And now they're calling it REDS, which is relative energy deficiency syndrome. Okay. So it's one, to th it's one to pick up on because, you know, it almost used to be sort of this hero trait that mm. you get to a level of, of training so hard and you lose your periods. And um, what we know now is that actually that's detriment on a number of levels. Brain, body, muscle, bone strength, um, mood. All of those things, sleep causes sleep disruption. Let's get into mental health stuff because uh, you, well, you, that's what you specialized in, um, specialize in, and also why you got into involved Originally. in, mm. and why you got involved into in triathlon because of uh, mental health reasons y from yourself. Yeah. So, um, uh, where do you think we're at with it at the moment? Big question. That have you got a big answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the fact that we're thinking outside the box in mental health now. I don't know. I mean, we've talked about this, um, you know, off camera, uh, the, the fact that the that people are now recognizing that the body and the brain are so entwined that you cannot treat, that we can't go on just see a psychiatrist and go on some antidepressants or some antipsychotics or some seeking tablets without looking at the imbalances in your body. And that was one of my biggest frustrations when I, when I practiced in the NHS psychiatry model was that you know, they rarely ran a blood test because that was the ownership of that was given to the GP who quite frankly didn't have time to put the two together. So there's very siloed, um, you know, the, the treatment between the psychiatrist and the GP was quite siloed. And they didn't understand that certain deficiencies in the blood, you know, the most standard ones, B12, um, folate, anemia, high cortisol levels um, could impact how you how you're meant to, uh, how, how you feel and function how you and, and your expression as such in depression or anxiety so I got involved in this because could I, can I just ask you a quick question yeah. is that the fault of the doctors or it's the fault of the if the fault of the doctors not doing it or the fault of the doctors not having the knowledge that that could be a factor I think it's a, a fault of the medical um, profession and the way we're trained per se I think it's going to change um, because we, I mean, we can't do everything right, and the GPs are completely overstretched, and so they now go down this, you know, tick box system where you have, you know, do they have certain symptoms, and if they reach a threshold, they'll go to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist will go down their tick box system, and do you have these different diagnoses? Because they're being forced by an NHS to put this person into a box so they can get funded, and we don't work in boxes, you know, mm. we're we're very complex in people, and one of the reasons I've got so passionate about educating people around their own health is because you know yourself okay and if you can if you can be signposted to read information that makes sense to you you can start to figure out things yourself so for me I was kind of let I, I don't want to say let down that's a, that's too strong a word I went through you know the mental health side of things so de common things you know depression anxiety eating disorders you know very common and the only way that was in an NHS model that was treatable was through therapy and um, you know, Prozac or the equivalents. And that just didn't work and it had its own problems. So fundamentally, if you want to improve from that, it's looking at your diet, it's looking at supplements, it's looking at social community, um, it's looking at the interplay of all of that. So when, we, when you look to my website and you're like, there's some talk around here about biopsychosocial. So that is essentially what I'm so compelled by is the biology of the person which can be seen in their what we can measure so a blood test or a urine test or a gut test getting some of that information the psychology is how you feel and function your thought processes um, and and building upon where you've been in your life so your life narrative your life story um, and then the social is 
you know, looking at how your work, your community, your sense of purpose, the people you interact with, and how all that interplays into who you are today. So all of those things have, um, have a role in how well you are and how well you will be and how well you will live. Um, and I think what we now know is that technology is advancing so quickly that if we can capture those three bubbles in a meaningful way and tell you just how what you can do on a day-to-day -day basis to improve your life now and through the next you know 30 years then that will meaningfully impact you know who you are do you know what's really interesting about this i I still feel so uh, you know this but mm. i've been through some depression i i feel still so uncomfortable talking about it um because of the stigma even though i do talk about it i have talked about it on this and 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 TV and the first time I got it was years ago and I really just kept it to myself but I've never had a blood test ever mm. for and I've paid because when I first got depression I was working in TV and I don't think it would have gone down very well I think there would have been potential that I'd have lost my job so I never told anybody and I just went privately for everything and even in the private sector where I'm paying a lot of money <laughs> mm. they never tested me for anything ever all they did was try and prescribe drugs so I've been prescribed um, antidepressants which I didn't get on with so I just came off them immediately hated it I didn't feel like me at all I felt like I was somebody else so I didn't like it and then sleeping pills is the other thing that you're given to try and um, yeah. h help you out again they don't help me they just made me more miserable so I then went on my crusade of reading self-help books a million of them and then you know having therapy which helps and uh, self-help books help as well I think and then you know I've arrived at this sort of place now where I feel comfortable in my life but I still have ups and downs series of, but still never been tested mm. so it's kind of interesting that y y it's just not something people do is it test for, for not men in, mental certainly health not in the UK and I think you know the the, the um it's accelerating this this kind of the way of looking at things we call it biochemical restoration so looking at the imbalances in the body and how that is reflected in the brain and you know with authors like um uh, the, the chap recently who released the book called inflammation in mind that kind of information is coming out now that that shows that what is going on in your blood actually is reflected in you know how you feel and function and i've directly experienced that so when i changed my diet i ate better fats i up my omega-3s I started taking liposomal, which is an activated form of turmeric, which is an anti-inflammatory. Um, when, uh, when I started to take methylated forms of B vitamins, because I knew my genetic meant I had to take an activated form of B vitamin, all of those things have definitely played in to how, how well I am today. And that is reflected in you know, more mood balance, more um, and, and, and performing better at life generally. So I agree with you. It's not well understood, especially in the UK. There's a few integrative psychiatrists popping up, but um, in the US, this kind of functional medicine, integrative medicine movement is is accelerating, and you know more and more doctors are looking to train in in functional medicine because they're fed up with this you know plaster approach, which is here's a symptom, let's slap a plaster on it, and you know the wound underneath is still festering. Why not give some things to help that wound heal? Mm. So is there more depression, do you think, at the moment than ever? I mean, we, Will Storr was on the show. He was talking um, uh, about his book, Selfie, and he said it seems to be an epidemic around the world at the moment, mm. that the, the depression seems to be on the rise. And, um, and There's a number <laughs> of factors to that. Yeah, so there are, because uh, our societies don't seem to suit us particularly uh, well, but also health reasons as, in the, uh, as well sure. in that. I guess it's, it's how we eat, it's how we live. Yeah, are, is, th is there more or are we just becoming like me? I was hidden away for years. Mm -hmm. Or are we just b being a bit more open about it and talking about it? I think life is, um, from an evolutionary standpoint, we're not living how we've designed and we need to kind of catch up. So, you know, we're, we're sitting more, we're engaged on our phones more, we're terrible postures, which affects our hormonal system. Roger Frampton's talked about this, his vlogs of theory. Um, mm. You can look at that. Um, yeah, so I think I think there's definitely um, a play with what we're eating. I mean, the quality of our foods. You know, people are having carbo. You know, the 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 instance of type two diabetes and even pre that sort of insulin resistance, it, which is caused causes an inflammatory state in the body, which causes neural inflammation, so inflammation within the brain, which then is seen in um, uh, sensitive individuals with depression and anxiety. So. The quality of the food is one. The fact that there's so many food additives. 
the fact that even our water is like you know got um, chemicals from people or the amount of women that are taking the contraceptive pills so there's the use of like standard medications like sorry like the contraceptive pill for example which we know change up the gut microbiome which has a signaling effect to the brain so we've got all these people on medications for one thing and then it's disrupting their gut which is then signaling to the brain that we're not quite in a good place so um, I think there's one so overuse of medications which we think cause no harm I think they do we just don't measure them measure that harm and then to the environment so just the fact that we've got more pollutants in our environment whether that's water air office whatever three it's the fact that we spend more time on screen so our natural light which comes through the eye which stimulates serotonin which um, happy hormones in the brain that all is being affected by the fact that you know we live in artificial light a lot we don't get out we don't ground ourselves enough um, and then you know I think it's people people are more people don't connect like these to we don't live in yeah you know, and we've talked what about society that. and stuff you mean social groups yeah those we're, sort of we're things. definitely not as good. tribal as, as we used to be and I know you, can, you know that there's a resurgence mm. of that now because people are realizing that's really important you know the role of we've recognized it for a long time in medicine we just kind of forgot about it because we got obsessed with drugs is that you know the power of the church and you know other groups community groups and actually you know a lot of the time people don't want to do it yeah but i think pe yeah people are desperate to get together in groups again uh so they go i'm a vegan or yeah. i'm a yogi or something and so they all come or i'm a carnivore they all come together in their little groups as that they and they want to identify they and want to identify yeah and be part of something yeah and the problem with that is sometimes is that people go to extremes yeah. and then other things go out of balance yeah. and then you're in this like you know i know lots of people i test lots of vegan athletes or vegans generally and they've all got sort of weird deficiencies <laughs> so what yeah so what what sort of things are you looking for when you test then so just i mean the basics if you get you get a standard i mean a blood test you know even things common things are common b12 um folate all play into mental health b vitamins <laughs> the major b vitamins you can look yep. at how anemic you are you can look at your vitamin d levels um this is all on a basic blood test and then you can look at how well your liver's working and then your stress hormone levels, cortisol, morning cortisol, that's high. It tends to be correlated, uh, a raised cortisol awakening response is correlated with anxiety. It's depression. a minefield, though. You, I mean, you, I'll come back to that, but you just talked about diet a minute ago. Mm. You talked about heavy carb diets and things like that. We, n we don't know, as, as mere mortals, we have no idea what to eat anymore. There are so many different diets and so many different people telling you different things. Mm. Plant-based diets are good for your pro high-protein, low-fat diets or this or that. There's so many different types. Mm. Do we really know where what we should be doing yet, or are we still, you know, what what would your advice be? Well, the future is, and it and it will get there because um, you know big companies like Apple and Google are obviously trying to solve this problem amongst others as well. Is looking at what, how can you tell from data about what diet works for you, and you know certain people respond better to you know a, a moderate carbohydrate diet. Some people really don't do well with high fat, low carb. You know, there's big keto movements you know do this yeah. do that but actually you know when you test you see some people getting it wrong so the takeaway from that is that we need to get to a way of affordably testing people giving them a right enough just enough data so they can see if a diet is working for them so some of that is even like wearable data so your heart rate variability which you can measure through an apple watch or a fitbit tells you how your sympathetic parasympathetic systems stress fight or flight rest and digest systems how balanced they are you know, diet affects that other things affect that mm. so that with a blood test can tell you whether you know your diet's working for you and then there's the genetic piece as well so i don't want to be disrespectful to the doctors because i think they're brilliant and they've got they've got so many people to see and they've they've <laughs> they can't go into too much detail with every person yet no. uh, but w the last time i went to the doctors with with uh, sick so care I, mean. I was I was really fatigued, and all they tested me for was vitamin D. That's the only thing they tested me for, which seems to be the common thing that people. Well, and and actually, do. it's nonsense because uh, the, the people aren't testing for vitamin D anymore now because they're just assuming that if you don't supplement in the northern hemisphere, then you're deficient. So, you know, there's no harm in taking a balance. I use vitamin D and vitamin K because otherwise it can throw out calcium balance. So, you you should take vitamin D. I mean, it, unless you're in the sun frequently, there's there's no harm from taking a quality vitamin D supplement. The things you really should test for mental health are thyroid function and um, a, a full anemia picture.
Um, and sometimes you can look at your morning cortisol so, levels. So when you talk about these tests, we, we're going to do some tests can on I, me can today. Can I just okay, say one on. thing? Because, yeah, go on. you know, the NHS is designed as a sick care, disease care system, right? It is not fully resourced to keep people well, which is why I've become empowered by, you know, giving people some information so they can live healthier. The consumerization of healthcare, which is coming from the US, will enable people to have more actionable information from a little bit of test. So they don't go to the doctor and say, doc, tell me what my blood test shows. An app is just going to tell you, take that data in, translate it, and tell you what you need to do. That's the way we're going. Okay, It's going to take your blood, your genes, your, um, your urine, and it's just going to put it all together and tell you what to do. But at the moment, that's too expensive in the UK. And I do that on a very manual ad basis for people and tell them how to live and they get better. But it's expensive. And the only reason it, why it's not going to be expensive is that big companies come in and they fund the cost of the test which is what has happened in the U.S. with a company like 23andMe. Do you know them, Genomics? Nope. So, you know, they were um, owned by Google's wife, um, Sophie's wife, and, and they basically subsidized the cost of tests so they could get the data in, which trained the sort of artificial intelligence system to, to, to recognize rules. Right. So, so basically... So it's ba basically AI, AI is going to uh, prevent us from getting disease? Yes, eventually. Mm. And from a very early age, I imagine we'll be looking at babies and going, "Here's your DNA from your your genes from your parents, yeah. or your DNA. Which one was it? I can never never get my head around it all because I don't know what I'm talking about." But uh, <laughs> we'll be DNA is in the cell, and then the genes <laughs> are on the DNA. Right. So, DNA so which which is the one which says I've, I I might get a heart attack when I'm older from my dad? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. What the, we well, know whatever, now is anyway. genes. Like one thing you can take away from the genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. You are not your genetic destiny. Right. How you live affects which genes are being expressed. And what we now know is that we can measure that expression. That's the way medicine's going, or the okay. consumerization of medicine. All right, so if you uh, completely unfair question for you, but you, you, Theresa May's just said we're going to get 20 billion more pounds for the NHS. Would you start looking at, towards moving the NHS into prevention rather than where we're at at the moment, which is pretty much cure, isn't it? We need to make, we need to utilize that system to make people more accountable for their own health so that they do not go to a doctor and say, fix me, because we don't have the resources to fix you, especially when they're at that level, because then the backpedaling to reverse their type 2 diabetes is a lot harder. So it's it's giving people some information so that they're more accountable for how they live. And, you know, I'm not a politician, so, so I don't know how we can make that happen. Yeah, so I suppose we've got to try and... Um, almost like a token system where you get people, you know, a reward token system where you get people out, you get people socialising, you get people moving, mm. you get people sleeping better, you shut down the computer at 10pm or you get, you know, the blue light out. So all of those things, it's almost like a social responsibility now to get people to live better so that their disease risk goes down. Mm. Going back to mental health, because I think that's a, this one I'm quite interested in. It's a big one. Um, you're, so you're looking at biomarkers. Am I, am I using the right? The biomarker is just a blood marker, a marker in the blood. So B12, vitamin B12 is a biomarker as per measured in the right. blood. So, so there's, there's numerous things that can give you, um, there's numerous things that can make you feel... <laughs> You are coming to my opening the door again. It's so, it is really hot in here. I'm using we, my biomarker test too. Yeah, uh, it's to uh, we're we're um, in our solarium. Uh, yeah, it's it's like a sauna in here. You might have to be door monitor and close it and open it when the when the planes come, Jen. Um, yeah. So 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 what are we looking at? We're looking at um, various different things that you could be deficient in. How does that manifest itself in depression? When Dan Davis was on the show, who's who's um, an expert in the the immune system. He sort of said it in quite a nice way is that when you get a cold, you feel pretty shitty. Mm. And so that is why you feel depressed. If he didn't know, uh, he, he wasn't being claimed to be an expert. He said, but he believes that depression now is more uh, yeah, in disease and stuff like that, where, where you, you feel crappy. So you start feeling miserable. And that's and is that what generally is happening in your body? Yeah. And I think, again, it doesn't happen to everyone. So people are coming to you. It doesn't happen to me. So there's all about, you know, how predisposed you are. Have you got a family history? Have you had a history of depression? You know, if you then are more predisposed to getting those low mood symptoms if you've got a cough or a cold. Okay, so we know that inflammation, so immune system activation when you're ill, definitely can cause mood symptoms. And, for, and that's why a large part of the medical industry are looking at treating um, depression with anti-inflammatories as opposed to standard medications like Prozac, SSRI, serotonin uptake inhibitors. Um, so they're looking at treating the anti the, the inflammation, and that 
is you know standard anti-inflammatory drugs but obviously you can have an anti-inflammatory diet so things that we know in the diet that improve inflammation are you know lick uh, turmeric curcumin has to be cooked with some oil anyway there's an absorption issue so um, omega fatty acids black pepper or something don't you with that? Yeah, you know that so i mean you can supplement with it i have a liquid capsule um so there's the, the, there's ways to work with your diet on inflammation you know getting out the refined gunk from your diet mm. all of that contributes to inflammation I, um so yes inflammation is definitely one i do find it's a minefield though um from a consumer's point of view there's so many things i'm being told constantly that i need to do yeah. that eventually it becomes it, it becomes too much it's it's over, overwhelming i'm sure the listeners are sitting here thinking the same thing oh God, mm. i don't know where to start with all this you know and we're just taking bits and bobs like i tried turmeric and all those sorts of things um is it similar for you who's an expert in the field there's so much information coming in i, I we've had a brief conversation about um uh, acid uh, psychedelics what do you call it psychedelic lsd, LSD sort Suicide of stuff how and, yeah. how how that they're thinking that's good thing and it's, it's it's early days but people seem to think it's a, it's a good thing when you're seeing all this information coming in is it quite hard for you to to uh, work out what the hell's going on too yeah, it totally is, and which is why I initially went to being data driven. So I'm like, let's test all this. Let's see what we can see in the in the tests. And sometimes blood tests just aren't enough because they don't they don't reveal the full picture. They're a snapshot. So I started looking at um, other other means of testing, sort of what they call omics science, which is various acids in the blood that reflect different things. And that's why I use this Dutch test, which you will do, and we'll we'll discuss the outcome. So basically, that. You know, I think you've got to be a, li a bit more data driven, um, and, and that's the way the future is going. As I said, you know, the technology is going to be able to take away all that cognitive dissonance from all that information and just say, "Look, this is what you need to do. Do it." Okay. Just and there's companies looking at that because so so for you, and as I said earlier, people that live longest are the people that are most engaged with their life. They have purpose. They have social community. They have a more relaxed attitude to life. They don't do things in extremes. That's so not me. <laughs> uh, so not me either. But you know, this is what we know. You know, um, e you know, even more important, smoke. You know, just get the smoking out, as you know. The, the, there's big habits, but you know, a, a community purpose. You know, is definitely is definitely yeah. a big one. So, what I want you to take away from that is that, you know, ha we know that we shouldn't have refined sugar. We know that we should moderate alcohol intake. Yeah. We know that certain supplements probably help us you know um we know that the use of psychoactive substances like lsd psilocybin you know proper companies proper universities are taking them seriously now things yeah. like lsd in very low doses because the dose doth determine the poison as we know um mdma you know things that really stimulate the brain and and encourage new neuronal connections because a lot of people with mental health problems need a hard reset okay and that that used to be in the olden days sometimes obviously used now and, and differently is electroconvulsion therapy which essentially puts did that yeah but did that brain. work huh did that work well it does in in some people it saves lives it? and i used to, when i was a um a, an internist as they call it a junior yeah. doctor I, I remember being horrified that we were putting electrodes and inducing a fit in people but you know some people that literally on their you know death door wanting to die kill themselves it really did and then for some people when, when i was working at priory they would have maintenance cct at a lower dose just to kind of shove you know make that make i find it really bizarre with the drugs thing because um i've looked into the the, the uh, lsd type scenario and and they were getting quite far with it weren't they back in the good old days in america before they started taking it recreationally they they thought it was helping um, mental health patients and everything else and then when when america i suppose we did we all decided to just blanket ban it and say it was an evil thing and get rid of it we stopped being able to see whether it would have any help the same with mdma all these things yeah. are just turned into once they become party drugs they get that yeah that they're, name and they're the devil and so and people die because they're cut they you know they're not controlled substances yeah. so the quality is you know terrible same happened with cannabis you know i mean it, it's cut with such dreadful things now we do you know it's not it's not a pure molecule so we can't control it yeah. so now obviously the you know people are looking at con you know controlling the what exactly is given and the dose adjustment there was a there's an article um published about a month ago that peter atia md i told you about him he's a fascinating guy to follow 
I've got a link to him on your website. Okay. Anyway, he, he published um, a research article talking about a form of ketamine that was used as a nasal spray in suicidal patients. And it was extraordinary results, you know. L literally, people went from being really suicidal to, you know, having clarification and, and, and wanting a future. And I think that's what we know that psychedelics can do. And Michael Pollan has been fantastic in bringing this information to a more public audience, saying, you know, for for very stuck brain patterns and behaviors, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, resistant depression, mm. actually some of these drugs can kind of cut through that, but it needs to be the environment, the context, everything, right? You can't just go out and take it on a you know, Friday night in Clapham and experience breakthrough. You need to be in a supported, safe, you know, therapeutic environment for it mm. to have benefit. So, so tell us what you're doing then with clients. What, what's, what, how do you work? Um, well, I have people call me like a, a, a magician, which I don't, I, you know, they introduce me to their clients as a magician, which I think is ridiculous. And I was like, do you know I have two degrees? <laughs> 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 I'm not a quack doctor. So. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I, I work with people on that biopsychosocial basis. So I, I see people, I explore their, uh, about their life. I often go to see people at home because I get the context of how they live. Um, so I look at their history, you know, what, what are they prone to? What, what, how do they live? What are their family like? And then... Where do they want to get to? What are, how do they want to feel? And often people don't know. They just know they feel crappy, they feel tired, they feel brain fog, they don't sleep. You know, their sex drive's tanked or they feel aggressive. Anyway, they're out of balance, okay? And then I take a relevant amount of information, so it could be a blood test. I, I do use this Dutch test, which is the dried urine test for comprehensive hormones, and that looks at various different systems. It looks at your adrenal glands, your stress system, it looks at your brain neurotransmitter turnover. It looks at your sex hormones. Um, and a few others it looks at your some of your antioxidants and so from that I can kind of get a pattern of who they are and by listening to them looking at their life getting some um, biological data we then kind of rebalance and so that rebalancing could be change in diet it could be strategic supplements and I do use a fair amount of supplements but I use medical grade supplements and I use them for a purpose and I use them for a time period and I tell people to be consistent with them and then take a break Hmm. So I use like I do use nootropics in people with things that stimulate the brain, cholinergic function, especially if people have brain fog or concentration issues. Um, I do use bioidentical hormones, biosimilar hormones in some people, and that could be DHEA, it, um, which is a pro hormone supports the adrenal glands. If there's in women, I often rebalance estrogen and progesterone um, and testosterone can be imbalanced and, and look at the reason their hormones are imbalanced. And then we give, we look at the adrenal glands, so their stress system. And for a lot of people, they're out of whack, right? Their cortisol's really high in the morning and then crashes at lunchtime and they feel terribly tired. Or for some people, it's so really low in the morning and high at night, so their patterns are dysregulated. So what would you do about that? So we, one, get people to, to, to realize it. So this yeah. is the marker, and this is correlating with how you feel and function, mm -hmm. right? So I do use... Um, I tell people, I mean, lifestyle stuff, cold showers, saunering helps. Oh, I do lots of cold showers and lots of saunering. I know. And, well, we don't know what your adrenal glands are doing yet. Yeah. I use, like I say, things that, that regulate the cortisol adrenal axis. Mm. So there's something called adaptogens, which are, are herbs that mm -hmm. have been in Chinese medicine for ages, but are now gaining more attention in conventional medicine that modulate that stress reaction. So stress is just stress right it's only how your body reacts to that stress mm. and for a lot of us we're wired in this constant state of fight or flight because of our experience in life and because of the fact that we're just reacting all the time so i do use adaptogens i get people to recognize it um i get people to change the way you know what they're, what they're acting like in that in that situation and um yeah sometimes we use so, so the ideal future really is yeah. that, that i mean obviously this costs money to do to see someone like yourself um, worth it if you've got it I imagine it's but kind of like a life intervention yeah. it's kind of like take all this information this is how I think you are this is a pattern of you this is what you would benefit from and then I signpost people to information and they we support them with a health coach and I suppose rather than us doing it as amateurs go to someone who actually knows what they're talking about but in the future it must be a situation where the NHS does this for everyone I mean it's expensive now but hopefully with AI I don't you think the NHS will do it. I think with the AI, um, you must be able to do or it. Or they'll partner with a company, oh, well, yeah. a consumer company. Yeah, that but it'd be great. It. You could take your blood, you could take your Dutch test or whatever, and then you can go down to the, 
you can put the things in machines look at it come back and say you're a bit deficient in this and then there's a lovely human at the end who goes take this do that and change your life stop going out partying yeah. <laughs> whatever it is you do so it's so exactly it's got, so there's got to be a bit of it, but, but, but the big part of this is you have to understand is that you know behavior change is the big one right and yeah. how do you get people to, it needs to be you need to be worried enough about the impact of your life to change your behavior so okay. health coaching is part of that so, so the idea is you're going to do these tests on me and then we're going to um come back in a couple of weeks time and you're going to reveal stuff that you think uh or you know um might have uh, i might be deficient in or lifestyle <laughs> changes or something you can't you you won't be able to tell me that i'm about to die will you from these tests so it's not it's not crucial like that is it? it's not no sometimes no. the lab comes back with like a really high marker of muscle damage and people ring up and say am i going to die of a heart attack because and right. then they've just been to the gym like the day before lifting right. those weights so. okay so you've got what what is uh, by the way if you because some um, dr tam's coming back in a few weeks time if you've got any questions for her it's ideal you can write in dear love joe podcast at gmail.com and we can ask her because she's going to come back and do another podcast with us uh we'll be going live as well on um, youtube because um, this is the first one we've, we've done we've streamed this live but i haven't really told anyone so i can't imagine many people be watching this live if you are hello but they will probably be watching it later on but we're going to start broadcasting these live so what three tests are you going to be doing on me so three so is it there is three we haven't got we haven't got the poop one with us but oh, okay. that's going to be sent i didn't think that would be that glamorous to go through <laughs> <laughs> that would that would, i tell you what that, live on that, air. that would make a good youtube video wouldn't it there you go we'd be straight up there what 18 yeah 18 certificate <laughs> tim does a poo um, so you're going to do a blood test and a Dutch test. What's a Dutch test? So, so the that's Dutch test is um, interesting. So it's, it's called, like I say, Dutch stands for, that it's a silly brand, really. Dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. Ah. So this is, um, there's two versions, but we're just doing the P1. So they're big, thick strips of blotting paper. I think you can see that, but not touch them. So you right. literally either pee in a cup and dip it in. Yeah. Or you pee directly on it, depending on how good your urine flow is. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean good? It comes out. <laughs> Um, just cover the strip. I think. What is it? Is is a is a better flow better or a lesser Tuck flow? Cover and uh, so you've got to hang and then you hang it <laughs> she's out. She's ignoring dry. me. <laughs> she's not. She's not embracing these, this line of no. questioning. No. Yeah, and you hang out to dry. Hang nice. it out to dry in your bathroom for 24 hours. I've had various people like ring me up again because women have to only do it at a certain time of the month, and the dog ate them or the husband threw them nice. away and like breakdowns. Anyway. So, so how how many do I have, have to do I have to do this? I have to do five. What so one you have a day? To do one. Um, no, you have to do it's over a period of, of 12 hours. You do one at dinner time, one at bedtime, one overnight. If you wake up, do you wake up to pee in the night? No. Nah. Oh, maybe your dreams are okay. Um, <laughs> It's when you're waking up peeing half the night that, that we know there's real problems. No, I just stay in and we... <laughs> That's good. And then you do one when you wake up and then you do one two hours after waking. Okay. All right. All right. And then you're going to do a blood test. Right. Okay. And then well, we'll, we'll do the blood test. We're going yeah. to do, we're gonna, we're gonna do the blood test in a minute. I'm live here. But I want to ask you the questions that we ask everyone uh, who comes on the show. So I'm going to do that with you. What, uh, what do we start with? Um, what is one piece of advice... That has been invaluable to your life. Never, ever, ever give up. <laughs> Never, ever, ever give up. Ever? Well, even if you've got a day out with David Goggins and he's, <laughs> he's going, we're going to run 16 marathons today or whatever. See, one thing that's kept me going, and sometimes it can be to my detriment, is, um, is just grit, resilience. Yeah, but I've had to learn to stop doing that. And I've had to learn to stop, just keep on wanting to win, and uh, because it was just, uh, it was just, I think it was ruining my life. There's context to everything, right? I it depends what you're not giving up on. Is it your passion? Is it your purpose? Are you really believe in something? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the other one is, um, yeah. Go on. Know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant. C contradicting. Yes. <laughs> um yeah contradict context is everything context is king all right uh what mistake do people make what mistake do people make? actually we've changed that question now we're going to do what is the biggest mistake you've made what's the biggest mistake i've made that's a difficult one we can i tell you my duathlon mistake you tell me that while i think about okay so i was riding around um i did the richmond uh duathlon it was 10k run 
20k cycle 5k yeah i've yeah. done it good tiny for you that isn't it that didn't even hard though, didn't it, even get a sweat up doing that did you yeah. but when i when i arrived at the uh to put my bike in i'm not used to cycling and um i borrowed a bike and i took the the wheel off to transport it and when i put the wheel back on i didn't lock it all the way in mm -hmm. so i did the it's two laps of richmond isn't it i did it with a brake on basically i i was cramped my whole right leg up i was crying I had tears rolling down my face. I had everybody was overtaking. I thought, I'm just so useless. And then I had to do the run afterwards. But it wasn't until I looked at my bike later that I realized I'd done it with the brake slightly on. It wasn't on enough for me to know the brake was on. It was yeah. just on. It was horrific. What pain. That was my biggest mistake when it comes to duathlon. What's your mistake? I've done many in, in, in the triathlon world. Um, I still think that's a difficult question to answer because do you know what? There's so many things that you look back on. You think if I'd have done that, then this would have happened. I think just not perhaps being too guilty of not connecting enough and just um, not taking on enough advice. And um, yeah. Okay. I, I think giving up on, on a relationship and probably moving on before I actually, uh, yeah. I probably should have just connected more and been less on my own trajectory of this is important and actually connected and stayed in the now and gone through the uh, through the tough times. All right. Uh, any life hacks? There's loads of life hacks. Go on, give us one. So light in the morning is a big one. Getting out there, getting light in through your eyes. For if you can, getting out to some grass, grounding yourself, putting your feet in some grass, wet or not, preferably not with dog poo. Get your feet in grass. Yeah, just ground yourself with so much. Yeah, I really? think grounding yourself is really good in the morning. Doing a bit of yoga, breathing, literally five minutes, really connecting with your breathing, um, calming your sympathetic nervous Wim system. Wim Hof, we've had him on this podcast. He's yeah. all about the breathing. He's all about the breathing. I think, you know, that's obviously taking it to extremes and people get overwhelmed. So I need to do the Wim Hof method and I need to do this method. Yeah. Just, you know, if you can do five minutes, putting your feet in the grass and doing some breathing, a little bit of gratitude. What have are you grateful for? Have you met Wim Hof? I have met Wim Hof he's in Barcelona. He's brilliant. He's awesome. I can't <laughs> understand what he says half the time, but you went on a bike ride in, um, yeah, in Barcelona. That was cool. You did? Yeah. Was he any good? No. Um, oh, sorry, in Iceland. Um, yeah, he needs nails. Yeah. He got up on stage and he just engages people. Uh, he's like the, I went to his course. It's like the cult of whim. It was amazing. He's just because he engages. He's just, he's charismatic. Everyone loved him. Um, he's real. He's got a real story. I mean, yes. but now you know, with all these things, they get taken over by commercial uh, people and marketeers, and then you're like, well, they dilute the actual sense of the person, the purpose. Yeah, he's great though to listen so to. So the him. life hacks there, like breathing, connecting with the self. I think you know one thing we've always discussed: saunering, especially after exercise. We know is a good proxy, so it all it in, increases the impact you're going to get from that exercise. Yeah. So that strengthening that stimulus from the exercise, sweating, sweating helps detox loads of toxins in our environment. That helps. Um, getting water, calming, womb like, definitely helps. Improving your sleep. Come on, we all know that. You know, being on a computer till midnight is a problem. Get F. Dot Lux on your computer, which takes out the blue light or web, blue light blocking glasses. Um, take time to really be present sometimes and be grateful for what you have, and not always looking at the things that you don't have. Good. I like all those, but the one I the one I like most is put your feet in grass every day. <laughs> yeah, I've got That's to thank Dr. To Tommy Woods, who I work with. He's a PhD doctor, insane. I've mentioned him. He's like, look, Tam, get out, put your feet in grass. Put breathe. your feet in grass. That's it. That's what to do. Any books you recommend? Um, so I really like Inflammation in Mind, which is one of the books I, I remembered, which talks about inflammation and depression. Um, that's on Amazon. I like that one that you've got over there, Tribe of Mentors, Tim Ferriss. Yeah, Tim's good, isn't he? He's good. Um, yeah, that's a good book, that. And also, what's the other one? Uh, he's got... Um, oh, God. Four-hour body, four-hour no, work what's week. What's the other one? Tours of Titans. Tours of Titans. Have you read yeah, that it's one? all about That's how good, you, yeah. you live your life better. They all say the same oh. thing. Learn not to be busy. Mm. Say no to everything. Mm. Uh, be in the now. Do some form of meditation, whether it be just putting your feet in grass or just, mm. you know, whatever it is. Get out in nature. It all, they all say the same thing, but but um, these are all basically Tim Ferriss writes a book and it's, he just interviews lots of successful people and asks them the same questions. A lot of them do cold showers. <laughs> a lot of them do cold showers and, and really 
suffer in it. But again, yeah. context, they're not good for women. It's definitely not good for skinny women because it puts a, a mean stress on your body. But there you go. Does it? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Stoicism seems to be big as well for a lot of these guys. Stoicism, but the one thing you have to take away from Tim Ferriss and a lot of these people is, you know, they've made it, right? Once you're up at the top of the greasy pole, it's easier to kind of look around and go, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Yes, and it is. You know, is. when you're still climbing that pole, it you is. know, you know, there who's has the, to be some who's feminism. The, who's the huge guy? Um, oh, God, you know, the uh, self help oh, guru in America. Tony, Tony yeah, Tony Robbins. That's it. And on, he, I, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening to him, and he's talking. He's going. Yeah, every morning I do a cold plunge, mm. and Tim's going to him. Well, where do you do your cold plunge? He goes. Oh, I've got a plunge pool outside my house. It's like yeah, because you're a multi-billionaire, yeah. so you got. Of course, you've got the a plunge pool. The most biohacked pool. house ever. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't have one of those. Uh, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? That's the final question for <laughs> oh, you. God, what is the meaning of life? Three warnings here. Just rattle it off. Come on. Meaningful connections and relationships. Is that what it's about? Yeah. Okay. Um, where can people follow you if they want to follow you? Um, Sporty Doc on Twitter. Uh, Sporty Doc. On Twitter, com. yeah. Well, and we're, we're undergoing a rehash of my, my website to reflect my move away from professional sport because it was... Love it, but it was killing me. So Yeah, why um, did you give up triathlon? Well, one, I had a, had a baby, as, as we now know, and yeah. uh, and two, then I then tried to come back and, and do it all, run a business, have a child that didn't sleep, um, mostly as a single mum, and run, uh, yeah, run London Marathon, and I ended up, like, in not in a particularly good place, getting urine infections, bladder infections, chest infections, and I'm like, I never get sick, and I have all this, so it was my body just saying no, so I stepped right back. And you never to get sick? Rarely get I'm going to tap that thing like you told me not to. I get sick a lot less now because probably because of all the stuff I've I been sick every week this year. I'm going to sort you out. Every week I've had a cold or something. It I feel miserable. It doesn't help miserable. having naily, gnarly kids <laughs> around, does it? <laughs> uh, everybody else around here is doing the little <laughs> violin signal at me. Okay, well, that, that um, is probably related to your adrenal glands, which we'll look at. So I better uh, be right on that. Thank you so much for coming on. We're about to do the blood test, but before I do that, I'm just going to say you can contact us at uh, my, my Twitter, at Tim Lovejoy, or you can email me, dearlovejoypodcast at gmail.com. Um, as I say, Dr. Dr. Tam, Sporty Doc, is going to be back in a couple of weeks, so if you've got any questions you want to ask her, just um, email them in or tweet me, and then I can ask her when she next comes on. So... Um, That'd be good. That'd be kind of interactive. Right, we're ready to do this. I don't know how we're going to do I've it. I've we'll never do done this live on camera. We'll probably do it the way. Oh, no. Goodness. You're going to struggle right. to find I'll a vein. I think we have to move the mics around like that. Let's do this. Excuse me. Let's move these around. And then maybe. You know, the doctors don't really take blood tests much anymore. Unless oh, it's no. It's always, it's always nurses. But actually, I do quite a bit because um, I work more private. Have a look at your veins. That one's a little bit wonky. That, that one's good now. Can you test? Can you, have you ever tested more before? Let's look at that one. I've had plenty of tests. Give me lots of pumping of your arm. Let's see if I bring it better. It's not a lot of body fat on you, is there? <laughs> I'm your oh, I'm smart at least like yeah. that. You actually, you, your tricep fat is very little. Um, it's been quite impressive. That. I can't scream or cry, can do you, I? Do you want to help me and just hold a bottle for me? And then when I ask, you just have this to... Oh no, you're going to explode. Oh God. Oh my God. I have washed my hands of the one before I got here. <laughs> that lick, I didn't actually feel anything, which is a bit worrying. That is a little bit worrying. And my blood is blue? <laughs> Why is my blood blue? It's what happens when it comes out is deoxygenates. Yeah, whatever, it's royal. Right, I'm royal! Thank you. 
I'm royal! Going in the needle bin, three vials, full blood count, electrolytes, urea, glucose, hormones, all of it. Excellent. And then we're going to hold that up, the bit I said that would sting a bit. Just put your finger down. Don't, don't bend your elbow because it kinks the vein, which causes a bit of scarring, which means you can't use it again. So everyone tends to do that and then. Tidy up, that should be fine. Work Brilliant. away.